Our scripture passage this morning comes from the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 58, the first 12 verses. Listen, hear, and receive God's word. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. And the people ask, why do we fast but you do not see? And why humble ourselves but you do not notice? And the response is, look, you serve your own interest on your feast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a acceptable day unto the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the throng, throngs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and the Lord will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall shine in darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and sh you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall rise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairers of the breach, the restorers of the streets to live in. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now there are times when the word of God is difficult to receive. I imagine that the Israelites felt that the word that they received from God's spoke person was harsh, untenable, maybe even a little unwarranted. God's assessment of the people's rebellion and sin was pronounced to a post-exilic community during a time of political and religious restoration and conflict. The people of God had returned to Judah and they were rebuilding and reorienting themselves. They had much to be thankful for, and yet their worship was not pleasing to God. Their worship and fasting were ritualistic and self-serving at best. You might say that the people of God were just going through the motions. They had a form of godliness, but denied the power and presence of God, according to the Apostle Paul. The people's fasting, their religiosity, and their worship were hypocritical. Their acts of piety, praise, and purpose were not pure, sincere, or honorable. In reality, their fasting and worship were all show and no substance, selfish and unjust, and caused violence to others because they were not attending to the needs of people who were oppressed, imprisoned, hungry, ill, unclothed, or unhoused. God made it plain that the Israelites' insincere, self-serving, and disingenuous fasting and worship were not what God desired, nor did it honor God. And the people had the unmitigated nerve to complain, inquiring of the Lord, why do you fast but, we, but do not see? Why humble ourselves but you do not notice? 
Well, in reality, God did see and God did notice that the people were only putting on a show, pretending and appearing to be pious and religious when in actuality they were anything but. God's reply was unequivocal. The fast that I choose is to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the throngs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourselves from your own kin? In other words, authentic fasting and worship are not about us gathering weekly to engage in worship just for the sake of doing so or out of habit or obligation. The fast and worship that God desires goes beyond church attendance, engaging in rituals, greeting the people sitting in the pews next to us, participating in meetings and in ministries that make us feel important, relevant, spiritual, or needed. True and authentic worship, the worship that God desires, moves us to establish relationships with people we would ordinarily just pass by on the street. True and authentic worship is sacrificial. It compels us to give freely, willingly, and graciously of our time. True and authentic worship compels us to donate the same food that we feed to our families to food drives, rather than just, you know, cleaning out the pantry and donating food that's um, just about to expire. True and authentic worship compels us to donate the same clothes that we would wear rather than gathering up clothes that are outdated, tattered, torn, or the wrong season for our siblings in need of clothing to cover and warm themselves. True and authentic worship is exemplified when we are out on the street standing with and seeking justice for the disenfranchised, the oppressed, the marginalized, and people who are treated unjustly by institutions, society, and the justice system. True and authentic worship is sacrificial, and it just may cost us something. It may cost us family and friends, status, our finances, and yes, even sometimes our reputations. However, I believe Jesus said it best when he said, blessed are you when people revile and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for the same way they prosecute, persecuted the prophets who were before you and also persecuted Jesus. Now, every November, we share the many ways that we live into the love of Christ here at EOPC. And I'm thankful for our members who feed the hungry, volunteer at food pantries, donate food, and provide and serve meals to residents of local shelters. I'm thankful for those of you who donate clothing and household items to the chapel market for our community members. I'm thankful for our members who volunteer and give their time and talents to community organizations that provide affordable housing and home ownership, employment, and educational opportunities. I'm thankful for our members who volunteer in our youth ministries, visit and call our sick and homebound members, and who serve on church committees. And I'm very thankful for our members who give financially to ensure that the mission of this church goes forth. And I'm especially thankful today for those of you who are sitting in the pews and considering how God might be calling you in this season to be more actively involved, to give more of yourself, to give sacrificially. Just like the people who had returned from exile, it is absolutely no secret that we are in a time of rebuilding. We are in a liminal space of already and not yet. Some of you might be waiting to see what and who is next, but I stopped by here this morning to tell you that this is what is next. Right now, in this moment, and on this very day. Amen? This is not the time for us to merely go through the motions, to wait and take a wait and see attitude, to have one foot in and the other foot out of the church, 
Now is the time for us to take off those masks that help us to appear to be holy, forgiving, and worshipful, and actually be who we profess to be as the people of God. Welcoming, inclusive, loving, and caring for the least of these, and sacrificing our time, talents, and treasures. Harsh words, perhaps, but God told the prophet to speak loudly and not to hold back, to lift up their voice like a trumpet to the people. And I'm going to obey God. I'm going to do exactly that. Every opportunity that I have to stand in this space and speak not only to you but to myself what thus saith the Lord. I'm going to obey God regardless of the cost. Beloved, when we move beyond pretense, formalities, rituals, and habits, and begin to truly worship God, the Spirit of God moves and we are changed. Circumstances change. Communities change. This church will change. People will gather here to truly worship and not just talk the talk and to share stories about our wonderful ministries that minister to the poor, the downtrodden, the humble, the meek, and the grieving, and the homeless. One commentator writes that Isaiah urges us to get back on track, to rejoin God's path. We must undo and break the yoke, Isaiah uses the yoke as a symbol for the bonds of oppression in the world or any of the ways that we tie others to ourselves in order to bend their actions to our benefit. The yoke means selfishness, using others to gain for ourselves and to achieve our own purposes. To loose the yoke means to offer freedom and release for people who have been used for someone else's gain. End of quote. And such is the theme of Isaiah and the cornerstone of Jesus' ministry. It's time for us to get back on track, ELPC, so that when we gather here, we are fortified through worship. And as true worshipers, when we walk the walk, we are not averse to getting our hands dirty. We are not afraid to look neighbors who are suffering in the eyes and ask how we might help them. We are not reluctant to share our gifts, talents, and finances to ensure that children can come here for spiritual and artistic enrichment. We are not resistant to providing a place that is welcoming to people facing their addiction. People who gather here to mutually support one another or providing financial support to this church so that our neighbors in need can secure warm clothing or work towards home ownership, stable employment, or seek assistance and help with paying their utilities, their rent, or their mortgage. True worship is relevant. Relevant. It is tangible and concrete. True worship is empowering. It is convicting, demonstrative, and reciprocal. The proof is in today's scripture passage. The messenger of God shared that when worship is authentic and pure, your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and the Lord will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise up in darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The commentator continues, the writer continues, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose water never fails. Your ancient ruins shall be re rebuilt and you shall rise up, raise up the foundations of many generations. You, we, all of us, when we do that, 
shall be called the repairers of the breach, the restorers of the streets and the neighborhoods and the communities and the people who live therein. In closing, I ask this question, and it is not rhetorical, so please feel free to answer. Are there any true worshipers and breach menders in this house today? Yes. Amen. I'm going to ask it one more time. And I know the Spirit of God is going to move up on your heart to respond and then live into it. Are there any true worshipers and breach menders in this house of God today? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Thanks be to God, and may it absolutely be so.